So welcome back. It's episode four of the Women in Sports podcast. I'm Lois Purcell. I'm really excited today. We're going to be talking all things netball. We're joined by someone who's done it all. They've been a player, they've been a coach, and now starting a really, really exciting journey as part of the Lead Rhinos family, and one that I'm really, really excited to see pan out over the next couple of years. So let's get going. Anna Carter, Director of Lead Rhinos Netball. How are you doing? I'm good. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, really good. Um you know, struggling with the old isolation thing like everyone else. I'm not normally massively one for being house proud, but I've got a, a list of jobs to do from skating boards to light fittings and painting and uh, just something to get my teeth into. So, yeah, interesting. <laughs> You're like me as well. Um, I, I think every time I see you, it's kind of running in or out of the office um, down at Kirkstall. You're always busy if it's coaching or, you know, whatever it is that, that's taking up your time but I, I'm I'm very much similar of kind of looking around and thinking well, I'm going to get it done now because as soon normality will return and we'll have no time to do it but I've not got it as hard as you you're you're now a full-time teacher as well to three little ones aren't you <laughs> yeah I am I, th- I have to say out of all of it that's the hardest thing because I've got a nine-year-old girl that takes it really seriously wants her work to be neat and tidy you know a bit of a perfectionist and then I've got a seven-year-old boy who doesn't care what his work looks like or what he does and then I've got a four-year-old who's got a, an attention span of a goldfish so um managing that I and mean, my husband's still working at the minute it, it's a real challenge so to not to have Easter um I guess has been quite nice because the kids have um been doing what they want which is yeah. a little bit to manage so yeah it's tough tough at the minute so we might have a four-year-old run past through the, through the camera. It might be one of them internet memes where a, a kid's running and they've got a parent chasing after him. <laughs> yeah, it's normally the case and complaining about his brother and sister so that they're bullying him or they're mistreating him or it's not fair. So, yeah, be prepared for that one. <laughs> I bet, I bet the, this, um, this quote has come out of um, all parents' voice at one point over this lockdown. I know it's not fair, but that's just life. <laughs> Yeah, I've said that a few times. <laughs> Funny. So I said I said before when we were, when we did the intro that you know you've had you've had a great playing career and then and transitioned to coach. But first, let just talk to me about your your playing career. Like, how did you get into netball? Where did that take you? And, and what are some of the the best memories that you've had? Gosh, uh, yeah. I mean, it seems like a long time ago now. But um, I suppose. With, with me when I was at school, I was always what they would have called back then a bit of a tomboy. So I threw myself into absolutely every single sport. I fought against being um, a, a girly girl, never really kind of mixed in those circles. So netball regarded back then as a real girl sport. I didn't really do. It was probably the only sport that I didn't get involved in. I did cricket, I did, I did football. You know, I was the only girl playing against the boys at lunchtime and that kind of thing. And then one of my friends said, why don't you come to netball practice? And I was a bit like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's for me. And she was like, oh, come on. So I went and I have to say, I remember the first netball practice I went to and I must have been about 10 or 11. And I remember everything about it. It's really strange um, how clear it fell. And I, I remember the teacher and everything. I just fell in love with it. Um, and I did other things up to a good level. I ran for county volleyball, kind of all, all the different sports. But I just had a love for netball straight away. And it's kind of never left me, really. And um, the friends that I've obviously accumulated over the years and everything. And um, <clears throat> I've been on quite a journey because even though um, I played netball for England, I'd probably say that my fondest memories are with the clubs that I played for um, and different things that I, w- I, I won with them, sorry. Whereas I felt for me, England was always something that I, I put up there as in um, I've got to achieve that. And if I don't achieve that, then I've not succeeded. Yeah. And I always work really, really hard. Um, and I was probably one of the fittest netballers because you can control that. And the oddest thing that I found um, about netball and about a team sport is your selections very much on the court that you have and their opinion and how they see the style of play and everything else. Whereas I feel like going back to club, 
I was always um, achieving because it was about that game. It wasn't necessarily about, you know, a World Cup in four years' time or a Commonwealth Games um, ambition that defined you at that point. Um, it was more about that day rocking up. And even though you had things in the season that you wanted to achieve, um, you kind of could get over it quicker because the next thing to be involved in was the following Saturday, the following Sunday, and you won or lost and you had a good game or a bad game. Whereas if you didn't get selected for the Commonwealth Games, um, which I didn't at one crucial point, it was so hard to pick yourself up again and know that you've got to go through it all again. Um, yeah. And you do, I mean, obviously, because it's what you want to do. But I did, um, I did really, really struggle with it as I got older so my fondest memories are winning things like national clubs as a player uh premier league titles in netball and and things like that really is is kind of where my heart was at so who who did you win those who did you win those those championships and those finals with which clubs were you playing at, at the time so uh ywca berry so i was over in the the northwest of yeah yeah <laughs> strong Lancashire accent still so um yeah I played for YWCA Berry with uh, Tracy Neville who, who was the national squad coach and uh, Karen Atkinson who, who coached Loughborough Lightning so any netball fans out there will, will know those names Karen Gregg who coaches Manchester Thunder now so we were kind of um you know, a really good group to come through um, because we, we won everything. We all went on to play netball for England. Um, you know, I also played in the World uh, Youth Cup as well with the current England coach, Jess Thurby, and as I say, Karen Gregg. So it was a really nice time to come through the, the Northwest system because there were people that went on and kind of coached at a high level. Is that that's almost like the 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 golden generation of netball, and I like the Leeds Rhinos have got this big like the Danny Maguires and the the Rob Bros. I'm just listening to all them names that you just reeled off, and it kind of it sounds it sounds quite similar, and it they have the best memories out there. I guess some of them when you when you get when you get them. I mean, I I shared a photo on Instagram the other day of just the day of the 2018 final with with Leeds Rhinos women, and I think I just look at that picture and it it it, it just. I don't know, it was just so much feelings and I think just that happiness or just, it, I, I kind of like can feel it now, even though it were two years ago, you can kind of just, in the snap of a click of your fingers, you kind of back there about all the, the, the happiness, the hard work, the journey and, and things like that. So I agree with you on that. It's very much so uh, that it's in your control. You can change it week to week, whereas internationally it is, it's definitely really, really tough if you, if you miss out and what was your what was your how long did your international career span for and, and when did you get those tough times i i um started i first got selected for england when i was 14 which was quite young they don't they don't select as early as that nowadays but i was 14 and, and played till i was about 22 yeah um, and i made the decision um to call it a day um and i'd probably say that i got everything my own way for, for quite a long time in my career. Um, I, I remember under 19s not getting selected for um, a Netball Europe um, competition, um, but I was a year younger. But I remember taking that quite hard at the time, but it helped me focus and, and really um, concentrate on what I needed to do. So I, I did little things like, um, you know, ask the coach to spend more time with me on certain aspects of my game. Um, I thought, well, what else can I control? I can get fitter. Um, so, I, I again, I worked on a couple of aspects that came back on my fitness testing. So just looking really at things that I could control to, to kick on. And then um, I went to the World Cup and we finished fourth, which was a, a disappointment for the, yeah. the group that we had. Um, and then I went into seniors and I personally found the transition from um, kind of junior netball under 21s to seniors really, really hard. Um, and the main reason for that is we had um, a couple of legends in, in the national uh, squad at that time um, and um, in the positions that I played. And they, they were, they were world-class athletes. And I think I kept going and kept pushing. And I remember one of the coaches just saying to me after you did the whole, you know, what else can I do? You know, is there anything else you feel I can focus on to make that next step? And she said, um, no, she said, they're just better than you. 
Um, so that was that was tough to hear. And I think athletes do that, don't they? Where they go, I, I just want a level of honesty from you. And, uh, you know, they give you that level of honesty. And then you're like, damn, you know, that's pretty hard. Yeah, <laughs> so um, especially when, you know, you're prioritising netball in, in your life and to be the best you can be. And you've marked your success from an early age of, um, play netball or whatever sport it is for your country it, it affects you in, in lots of different ways and um, you know when somebody gives you that harsh reality check I do think you think well how much do I want this and how much further am, am I prepared yeah. to go to wait for that opportunity um, because if any of those players that I was talking about got injured then I would have had that opportunity mm -hmm. and I suppose it, it became a bit of a waiting game, really. And and how how, how did that waiting game go? Or... Didn't go well. Um, <laughs> because um, the Commonwealth Games uh, selection came and it, it was a really funny moment for me because I, I was still, still young at 22 to give up international netball and I felt that I was falling out of love with the game um, because I was playing that waiting game a little bit and I took a step back and concentrated on my club netball and personally I really enjoyed that time and I did go on and we, we won um, Super League I think two years on the bounds and I absolutely loved it and it was probably the best time from that perspective but I think once you step away from international duty whatever it is it's almost harder to get back in yeah um you know when you're in you're in and it's you know harder for them to shove you out whereas when you're out it, it's really really hard to get back in because their attention turns to other people so um from a personal perspective it was the right decision because i ended up enjoying the club netball and everything and found my love for the game and that was the point where I started getting into coaching because suddenly my weekends weren't full of England netball duty I had a bit more time so that was the the gap for me to start coaching but I think if there's anything reflecting back on my career that I regret was probably not sticking it out a little bit longer um, and that's the message I, I sell to a lot of the girls that I work with when they, they've made that transition and I think you do think well I'll just you know make that step at some point that opportunity to play senior netball and I did go on a tour with the, the national squad but you know at some point my dreams are going to come true. Yeah. And they don't. And um, I think dealing with that side, and I always say to the players a little bit that are going through a, a bad time is just focus on enjoying your netball because if you're enjoying it, you're not losing anything. And if you get on, you know, you, you to play for your country, it's a bonus. Don't waste all your time kind of uh, fighting and not enjoying it and feeling like there's injustice in it think about the things that you are enjoying and through that opportunity will come if that makes sense it's a bit of a reverse of looking at it and I think if somebody would have had that conversation with me um, at that time I'd have probably thought well yeah I need to just kind of take the intensity off this a little bit and think about it a bit different. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. I think that makes a hundred percent sense. I'm, I'm I'm just thinking about it now and, and the cogs are turning in my head and, and stuff like that. I think when you say fourteen to twenty two, that, that twenty two does seem young, but that is a long time. Like yeah. a long time to be to be to be in the system. I know when, when I when I retired my knee, everyone always, everyone kept saying to me, But you yeah, but you're really young and at the time I were how old am I now? I think I'm oh, 28, 27, 28. I can't work it out. My years have all gone. I've been locked down too long. Um, <laughs> and everyone kept saying that. But then when you put it into perspective, the amount of time and energy that you put into that, then it, it's not like a short period of time and it, it's not young because it's it's taken a, a large chunk and proportion of your time. And I think it seemed like a really mature way of looking at it. And it's it's so tough because the, the, the best... I would say the best rugby that you play then, but the best netball or the best sport that you will play is when you're enjoying it. And I think you're potentially right. If someone had maybe had the opportunity to say to you that, you know, be in both programmes, but focus your efforts on, on here because that will really, really in the long run have a benefit on both, both outcomes. And, and I think it's right. And do you, think, do, you, do you really appreciate that coach for being so honest with you? And is that something you learned from and took into your, to your coaching role as you started coaching? 
Yeah, I think when you, you get older and you reflect on conversations, um, you know, you, you kind of go like, you know, that was the right message in, in some regard for it to say. I'd say the only thing she didn't back it up with was, but kind of, I'm not denying that you're not a quality player or something yeah, along yeah. that lines. It was just, they're better than you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but, you know, I need you. It's some kind of refocus that I was valued. And I think that was the bit for me when I went into the senior squad that um, I got, that I didn't feel, and not that you have to go around all the time giving players a pat on the back, but I do think when you're not making the starting seven, are you not continuously selected in a squad? Um, I think getting the players to feel valued is absolutely massive. And I think you lose people because you do feel disconnected and everyone puts ownership on the subs or whatever you want to call them to still be engaged and give 100% and still hit the fitness um, requirements. But then nobody goes, um, you know, I value that, that, what you're doing, like what you're doing, to make sure you hit all that is really important to us. And um, I, I remember, um, I mean, I think this was a, another turning point for me. I, I got picked for my first tour um, to Australia, New Zealand with the national squad. And it was massive. You know, my family were really, really proud of me and, and all that carry on. I was proud of myself. I thought I'd made it, you know. And uh, we weren't on tour and we were playing against um, New Zealand in um, a three test match and they brought 14 and at that point for a squad you could only select 12 so um, two were there really as, as a bit of experience to get on the tour and there were me who were one of the youngest in the group and another girl and um, the coach did a team meeting and said in your break now for the next two hours I'm going to come round to a couple of people's rooms and let them know they're not in the squad. I'm not going to make a big announcement now. So anyway, the the kind of rest period had been and gone and nobody had come to my door. So I thought, flipping heck, I've been selected in the 12th, for, you know, the first uh, my first ever test series against New Zealand, who, who were number two at the time in the world. So this is massive. So um, I phoned my parents up, as you do, like, I can't believe this. I've made, I made it into the 12th. And so I went down to the physio's room to get strapped, ankle strap ready for the game. And uh, she said, what are, what are you doing here? I said, well, I've come to get strapped, um, you know, for the game. She went, Anna, I hate to tell you this, but you've not been selected. And <laughs> so this was the physio. And um, I mean, the, my emotions took over a bit now again, which I regret. And um, I went to the coach's room and I, I said, oh, I, I, like, I'm a bit confused. I've gone to get strapped. Yet yeah, the physio's told me that I'm not in the 12. And she went, no, you're not. And I went, well, I'm sorry, but that's, you know, nobody's come and told me that and you know and she said well I, I wanted you to go through the match day experience and I thought well I'm not going through the match day experience so anyway we went to the um the venue we had to me and this other girl had to get um dressed we had to warm up on the court and then when the team had finished warming up and we're getting ready for match prep we had to go into the stand with a kit on and sit sit down and it was just the most strange situation I'd ever been in. Yeah. And I think it's stuff like that when when you look back in your career as and you're a coach and you go, What what am I trying to get out of this? If I'm I'm trying to get subs to feel the match day experience, then why don't I just tell them that? I think the hardest thing for players is when things come at a shock, you know, when you're not selected yet you've played starting seven all year and then that one game to start with you and there's no kind of um, inclination from them that you know things may change or we're going to try a different style in that game and try and talk you through it. I always think you know decisions coaches make sometimes where they haven't included the athletes in the decision really rock the world and um, that's something as a coach I've tried avoided a little bit is um sending messages to players and it being a massive shot that they didn't see that come in yeah and I think that that's the thing isn't it? it's like I'm listening to that and I, I'm going through the emotions I can imagine that you will have gone through as a player because you know it's a league sport at the end of the day and, and and the one thing that we all know is that not everyone can be happy and as a coach the hardest thing 
I mean, Chev Walker said to me the other day, he walked into the office and you'll have had loads of conversations with Chev and it's just popped into my head now and he went, have you become an idiot yet? I know what do you mean? We didn't actually use them words, but I can't swear <laughs> on them. And he went, it's, you're a coach now, you, you are one because at some point you're going to tell someone something that they don't like. And and that's it. But I think that but by the sounds of it, like you've really learned that, and at the time it just seemed like it, it rocked your world and it's the most negative thing that could happen. But like for me, sitting back and listening, it sounds like it's actually been quite a positive thing for you to go through those feelings because it if you didn't have them, you certainly wouldn't have been the coach that you are today and you wouldn't be on the journey that you are. So I think it's it's that hidden message again in there of that kind of everything does happen for a reason and at the times you just think that there's, there's, there can't be anything that I'm learning from this because as a young girl, you'd have just been thinking, this is crap, like, I haven't learned anything from yeah. this. <laughs> it's just horrible. But I, I definitely agree that, that that needs to be a conversation that you had. I mean, I, I've been dropped the 2013 World Cup. I, I we had the first opening game against Australia. It was a home World Cup, and I, I thought I was in the best best position I could be to play in that World Cup, and I was the best version of myself. You know, you kind of you've trained so hard. I remember the coach Chris Chapman sitting me down and kind of he was saying to me that I, I've not picked you, and at the time I would just I, I was kind of thinking of. Well, what are they doing that's better than, than what I can do? And I, I believed in myself, which so it was really, really tough to take. And it weren't it weren't arrogance. It was just I had some confidence about what I could do. But I I respected the fact that he was honest with me and he told me exactly what he wanted from me. And he, the fact that he'd been honest with me that I wasn't where he wanted me to be. And I think looking back on it now, it's probably the best thing that happened because it, it really pushed me on to to prove him wrong more than anything and to prove anyone else wrong who thought that of me. And it, that probably quite a powerful turning point for me. I mean, I, I still went out because I was only probably 18 or so, 19 maybe, cried outside the hotel in, in Leeds City Centre. <laughs> it was human because I was like, I was so close to home yet so far, bringing my mum and boyfriend like, no, for are me. Um, <laughs> but it kind of, it did teach me something and I think that that honesty was something that I massively respected and, and this is like probably something I'm quite interested with you now is you, you've had a brilliant coaching career with um, with both Yorkshire Jets, um, had some of their most successful years under your your head coaching and and love for lightning. So what what are the things that you may be? So what were the transition like for you as a as a player to a coach? Did you have much time in between that transition or not? Um, no, I didn't. I mean, I got I, I've always coached um, when I was about, again, 14, 15, I went back to my primary school and uh, coached there because um, it was, you know, one of them where the net, they wouldn't have had a netball team unless somebody external came in. So I, I started coaching at 15 and um it, you know it was about winning that was it even even back then it was about winning and not necessarily about um developing players it was how can I win this game and, and that was it and then um you know I, I kind of moved up and and coached at county level and then I coached the northwest high performance where it was regarded a good team of coaches really good team of coaches where we brought a lot of England players through at that point age group players and um yeah it was it was easy really but I never thought focused on being a, a coach it was always just something that I did because I wanted in the back of my mind I didn't realize this at the time but I just wanted players to be better and then I enjoyed working with players that could do things that I couldn't mm -hmm. um, and I got loads of enjoyment out of that you know seeing that you know that player can do that I never could do that or I still can't do that and things like that so and then it hit me one day that um you know the the team that I was um coaching I we were playing at the same time as and I was more bothered about their score than I was about the score in the game that I was playing and about how such and such a body played and did she try that and I talked to her about that and why did she do it and you know that kind of thing and, and I was driving home with my mum and uh, my mum just said, you know, you, you're really shifting more towards your coaching than you are to, you know, you're playing. And I think you need to have a think about what you want to do with it next. And, um, you know, she was right when I, you know, I, I went home and I, I had to think about it. And I thought, yeah, she's right. I'm really passionate about this and it really matters to me. And I wanted to be a PE teacher. And then I went into certain situations where, you know, not everybody um, loves the sport as much as you do and whereas as a coach you've already got a hook in like the players are already hooked on the sport 
honest in that love that they've got and that enjoyment. So, you know, as a PE teacher, it, it's really, really different. So I thought, yeah, I, I want to be and I want to, um, you know, do do my bit and bring individuals through and win some stuff. And so I started coaching schools, junior clubs, and then got into seniors. And, um, you know, I was harsh. I was really, really harsh at first, really strict. Um, and uh, some of the stories now that the girls have started coaching with, Natalie Athorn Thwaite being one of them, who's the England Roses coach, I think, oh, my God. <laughs> Why did they ever come back? Because I was so harsh <laughs> with them. Um, and that's, uh, again, something you develop is, um, as a coach. You know, you find your, your own way. I think you lead in with how your influences have been. And then you see other people coach and you kind of find your own way. Um, and then um, I got the opportunity to apply for a role at Leeds Beckett as director of netball and part of that was doing um, the Super League team where, which was um, Leeds Carnegie eventually turned into Yorkshire Jets and um, it was a dream job really so um, I applied, I got it with 27 as a, a Super League coach which is young um, and I thought it'd be easy. I thought going from player to coaching would be easy. And then I ended up coaching, which you'll know with this, I ended up coaching some of my friends. And uh, that that was a challenge. But I always had uh, respect, which I know you have with, with the girls you work with, and that's massive. Um, whereas I think if I'd have been with a different group that I didn't know I think it, getting that respect would have been very different right? yeah. because they knew me and knew my story and my playing background and we've been through stuff together they were like massively supportive of you know me going into coaching at that level so um yeah then that started the Super League thing and uh, you know I, I found coaching tough at Super League I enjoyed coaching the age group stuff more than Super League because I, I read something the other week that Eddie Jones put out about him not enjoying coaching um at that level and um and I, yeah, I'd probably say I had the same conversation with Brian McDermott when he was at Leeds about, do you enjoy it? And uh, sorry, I'm going down a whole different road here. But no, I, like I, I wouldn't say at Super League, I've, I've massively enjoyed coaching at that level. And I think that's led me to, to make this, be really honest with myself about where, what age group I want to coach and what's for me next. Um, and whether it is about enjoying it and whether I'm, I miss it, uh, not coaching Super League kind of the last, this last season. And uh, working at Loughborough Lightning was really different. That was a brilliant setup there because I've gone from Jets where we had hardly any resource, uh, we were beg stealing and borrowing a little bit, to Loughborough Lightning where the setup was probably as professional as you can get it. Um, it was, um, you know, really good international players. Um, who you know just wanted to get better and anything you gave to them they wanted more because um, they just wanted to be the best they could be so um, and then we're here now we're, we're kind of deciding on players that we want to work with and what Leeds Rhinos is going to look like but for, for me personally as a coach I've been on a journey of I've coached everything now so what's the next steps for me what do I actually want to do and where do I see my impact it's really interesting that you say that and, I, and I'm going to ask you if you've got any advice for me because I'm very similar to you. I often think to myself sometimes, is it a good thing that coaching the girls and the know me as a player, the know me as a friend and now they get to know me as a coach or it, you know, is that something that's going to be tougher? And like, I, I wouldn't say I'm struggling with it, but I think it, it's certainly funny. I've got to, I've got to stop myself because I like to have a laugh and I like to have a joke. That's, I think that's the rugby league part of me. But it's now having to stop yourself when, you know, you've got your player and coach's WhatsApp group or you're at a training session. And I want to be that person who does something stupid, like slap someone out backside or put something stupid in the group. Then I've got to bring myself back and be like, no, you can't do that now. So I'm, I'm going through that journey myself as well. And I'm, 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 I think I'm doing all right. I've not, I've not done any of those things I've mentioned. They've stayed in my head and, and they've not materialised. But what's the biggest bit of advice that you'd give to me from the journey that you took? Um, I think my advice would be, I think, 
I took it, I'm not that I'm saying anyone didn't take it seriously, but I didn't go out with the players. Um, and yeah. if I did, I stayed for one and then when I made it clear that I was, you know, the head coach, the kind of boss. Um, and yeah, I'd say that was the thing is that I, I had to separate myself in just the way generally I conducted myself. Like I said, the not going out thing. I, I could still uh, crack a joke, but I'm not that person anyway. I'm not the massive kind of overly friendly um th- person i've got an assistant coach who's very maggie birkinshaw is very loud very fun she brings all that kind of energy I'm more of the right this is what we're doing this is why we're doing it we've talked about this i'm i kind of bring that entity a little bit more because i think people need to know that that you're the boss as much as you've yeah. you know you friends and you're approachable and all those things um you know there was always a line that the girls knew wasn't being crossed and I think it's hard to maintain friendships when there becomes that you know um I suppose yeah yeah yeah, it it does so if you find a way to do it will you let me know if I find a way to do it I'll write a book because everyone will be asking that question (laughs) hey it's early it's early doors I've been in the job a couple of months (laughs) but it, it's been, it, it is good listening to, to, to that sort of journey that you've been on and, and seeing the success that you've had. And we've spoke about, um, you know, your journey as a player and how that shaped a lot of things that you're you're doing now in life. And that were, that were really, really interesting. And then the Loughborough Lightning, Yorkshire Jets. And now I, I was thinking about this because obviously I asked you if you do the podcast with me because I know how hard you've worked over the past sort of two or three years. And... When I started thinking about it more and more, there's so many similarities between what you're doing now with, with Lee Rhinos netball and the Lee Rhinos women's team. And and I just think, how exciting. So just basically give you a bit of time to talk about what's happening now with Lee Rhinos women's netball and, and how big are the next couple of years going to be? Oh, I think it, it's massively exciting. I mean, when... Um excuse me, Yorkshire Jets um, disbanded and was no more. Obviously, we're all heartbroken because even though it was built mainly on volunteers and things like that, that is netball. You know, we've never known any other way. So um, there, there was obviously some things that we could have done better. We, we took a, a learnings from that and we'll into, into rhinos. But, you know, we started to think about what might be the next steps and how we could get into... Um, back in Super League. We already had a relationship with the Leeds Rhinos Foundation. They'd supported us in our last year. So we'd already um got a relationship with the club. Um, you know, I um we'd had a couple of informal chats with Gary, um, you know, around the Leeds Sports Award, the mixers up. So we we're already kind of getting a, a relationship there and um uh, Brian had invited me down to watch the first team train and stuff just more for my development really and I thought my god you know this is pretty amazing what they do we just um and then you start taking an interest in kind of the marketing and the bigger picture stuff that we didn't have at Jet so um you know I was sold on the setup on the on field that they offered the boys and you know how professional that is and and the conversations that we're having there and then started taking note about you know as I've said the other stuff that we couldn't have the marketing the kind of look and feel of the club the messages that they're sending out the fact that they're so prominent in the community was really important to us particularly when we're dealing with a lot of volunteers as well um and you know just the values in general from the club to the foundation so um, we started off a, a couple of us kind of p- pitching to Gary, although it was more an informal chat around, you know, do you feel that netball would sit in the club um, and, you know, we would be really, really keen to make steps into getting a Super League franchise again and how do you feel? And so Gary just said, well, let's put some netball activity out there. Um, and let's see what happens and um, the first year we we ran hubs and everything else we weren't um, accredited by England Netball at that point we were kind of more of a standalone business but we needed to start somewhere Um, and the take on that was huge Um, we had um, you know a few hundred girls already signed up to that and then uh, the second year we applied for the performance pathway so we have um, a contract with England Netball to run 
um, the, the performance side of it for the age group. So we got that. Um, and Yorkshire Netball were very supportive in, in that application as well, I should say. And then uh, the following year, we went for NSL and got awarded it for 2021. So it's been um, really hard because um, we've had to keep going for the accreditation and to get in NSL. So even though to people it seems like a really quick journey, to us we've had, you know, little bit to spice each time you know we got the player pathway and then we got the nsl but it's not that year it's the year after and then um yeah. of course now we've got the the kind of coronavirus and everything else content way leading into our entry but um yeah i think for for us what rhinos has, has given us as a as a sport and seeing you guys as well and how well supported you've been is I think that's just confirmed what we already knew. Um, you know, the support that you lot have had is that how professional they are, how when they say they're going to do something, they do it well. Um, and, you know, it is a family. And I know every organisation says that, but at Leeds Rhinos, it is true. Um, you know, everybody supports one another um, when the World Cup run. Uh, netball world cup some of the first team players have been to watch the world cup and i was like why why have you been there and so with some of them the um you know cousins played or whatever um some of the new zealanders um and they'd also played netball because it's quite popular um in, in mixed terms in australia and new zealand so yeah i think for us it was about professionalizing the game taking netball in in a direction that changed it and that everybody looked to us as that model to want to work towards um, nationally and internationally at some point. And I think that kind of cross code and that sharing of ideas and support is quite common now. Um, but in netball, we've probably got a couple of teams that have linked with rugby teams and they're just standalone they're not really embraced by the club. Whereas I have to say from day one, we we have been embraced in the club and people have been really interested about what we're doing and how we're doing it. I mean, you you alone, Lois, we've had many conversations about, you know, what the benefits are of being part of Leeds Rhinos and how we can improve what each other's doing. And, you know, so it is a great environment to work in. Definitely. And I'm going to speak to you about the youth development stuff and some of the conversations we've had, but just while you mentioned it, I don't want to give it too much air time, the, the C word, Corona. Um, <laughs> what has that meant for the in Super League at the moment and your plans as well at these Rhinos netball? Yeah, so um, the um, NSL of uh, took a pause, obviously, and, and the reviewing it, I think there's um, kind of two decisions that they've narrowed it down to. One is that some type of competition gets played um, before the end of July if it's allowed uh, or the other one is that the season will just pick up again uh, next year and, and no further domestic netball will be played this year other than Fast Five um, and there's a couple of risks I think with the second one um, that you know netball's massively on the rise at the moment we had a, a sellout opening weekend of, of 10,000 people plus good um, um viewers on TV so netball's in a really good place and I think to starve you know the netball advocates out there and massive netball fans till next February of domestic netball I, I think it could hurt us um, but equally there's complications around contracts and um, but again netball's big thing is a lot of the girls aren't playing because it's going to pay the mortgage or, you know, they're going to retire rich off it. They still play netball because they've got a love of the game. So um, whether there'd be a little bit of a compromise for the players to go, you know, there's a greater good here and a greater need for the game, I'm not sure. And then um, the other one, of course, would be um, doing some sort of competition to whet the appetite. Um, but because none of us know when all this is going to be lifted, then it's really difficult to plan for a competition when you don't know you know when we're going to see the light of day again so for for us it, it's not as yet impacted they're still looking at 11 team league next year i think if they 
didn't run anything this year and just picked up in February. It would just start as they'd always propose that it started again. Um, all our netball girls we've supported that are on our program, they've all received uh, packs. They've been having uh, Zoom sessions with the coaches and also with the um, S and Cs as well. So we are looking after our athletes as as well as we all can. We are trying to overload them as well. So 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 far so good. Um, and you know Dan's uh, Ryan head coach is planning like mad, and you know we're still staying on top of the, ta- the timelines that we've put in place to secure a good entry in 2021. No, it, it, it's, you just got to do the controllables, and you got to do the little things that you can do. I saw, I think you were Sarah tweeted, um, S&C coach Sarah's tweeted, and I've seen the picture of the girls doing the Zoom session, and it's good to see them keeping busy while whilst obviously you can't. That's the toughest thing that I'm finding at the moment, is not having that, that, that contact with the girls of... It's really it, everything can get lost in translation through a WhatsApp, a text, an email, an email, um, and even when you you know a phone call, it's still quite tough. Um, but it's good to see them doing what they can. And and the, I was going to ask you this, but you mentioned it there: the growth of women's netball has been has been has been really really considerable over the past couple of years, and it's heading in a great direction. And I'm sure that they'll they'll stay on that trajectory. Um, for you know netball and rugby is. A bit different in terms of the product, but not in not not necessarily in terms of the journey. But what what do you think is down to that success and that that growth? Is it that 2018 Commonwealth Games? What what is it? Yeah, I think there's probably that because I think there's um, a lot of people that found themselves watching netball that wouldn't normally. I think that's a great thing about the Commonwealth Games and things like that. Is you know, you, I, I find myself as a somebody that just loves sport watching a sport that I wouldn't normally when it's Commonwealth Games because the sport I want to watch is on next so you watch a sport that you wouldn't normally and go oh you know dressage it's actually yeah. older than I thought it was so you start getting the respect and I think again because we're all bought into the Commonwealth Games as a competition um, if any of the teams are doing well and have a chance of winning gold or silver, you naturally watch it because you want us to... I mean, hockey was a perfect example. Again, they went on a massive trajectory after their um, Olympic gold medal in... Was it Rio? Yeah. So, um, you know, again, they got the massive uh, boom from that because uh, the country wanted to see us win another gold medal. So I think we had a lot of people watching netball that probably haven't watched it for years. And I think we've kind of hit lots of different areas for people to get back involved in the game whether it's walking netball and you know your grandma or somebody that's been injured can suddenly start playing again um they're doing a lot more in mixed netball um so again i think the pickup has just been huge and i think also just the massive social change in men going to support their daughters play netball you know i think now there's a lot more of a family feel around going to watch your child play sport it's not mum takes daughter to netball and dad takes son to football there's a lot more kind of understanding that you know you just want to support your kid in whatever sport they do and whether they're a boy or a girl and then I think the respect of the sport then builds up and the fact that it's on telly now well usually through the season on sky and people have a lot more access to it I think they're kind of the main contributors really to it Definitely, I'd agree. I think that the women's grand final uh, last year, being able to tell the girls in the school that it's going to be on TV, live on Sky Sports, were like a massive pin- pinch yourself moment of, you know, we're heading in a great direction here and hopefully we can be similar to the netball and we've got a home World Cup next year and I think that that's going to be a massive opportunity. I'm really excited about seeing what at the foundation and at Lee Joyner's Women Week can capitalise on. So, fingers crossed and hopefully that'll be a really, really good one and Speaking about schools, I know you said that you really enjoyed the development coaching and things like that. It obviously was a massive blow for you. Having that passion, and I think that's the word that I would sort of like use and associate with you, Anna, when I've, I listen to you and I watch you working and everything that you're doing is you're so passionate about it. Um, when Yorkshire Jets, Jets disbanded, was that obviously a massive blow for you for not just you as an individual, but you kind of thinking, what about all those girls that, that live in, in this area, Yorkshire, like Leeds, you know, wider West Yorkshire, they're not going to have an opportunity to to actually be on a pathway and to, it, it's kind of a bit similar to me that when I worked for the foundation and I used to say to them, 
you know, you can go play rugby and they go to me, who do you play for? And I'd go, Bradford Bulls. It kind of do not make sense. You kind of feel like you're on a journey now that makes sense and that makes it even more exciting. Yeah, I think there, there is that. And I think um, the players and, and the netball community have just been excited about the journey. And right from the get-go, we've wanted to make this journey about the people of Yorkshire and the netballing um, family is that they all felt part of the building to Super League. Um, so we have tried to get the message out there as much as we can. We have, we, you know, we made it a people's bid. We made it really obvious to everybody that we were bidding when we bid um, and things like that because everybody hurt you know, that were involved in Jets um, when it disbanded. And there was a real lack of clarity for the players in what I do next. You know, if you're at a particular age where, you know, the, we lost the under-21s and we also lost Super League, you know, a lot of the players were then in a position where they had to, you know, evaluate how much does netball mean to me because now I've suddenly got to travel an hour and a half to two hours to access my next franchise Whereas, um, you know, and, and you had to have the support around you as well to be able to make that journey. So you had to have mum, dad, nana, whatever, who were really supportive in driving you, you know, on a three hour round trip, if the traffic was good, to Loughborough, to Manchester, to the North East, for you to be able to make those next steps. So I also felt England Netball were taking out a massive pool of talent from Yorkshire that we'd always prided itself on being a little bit of a conveyor belt of producing you know some of England's best players so I think I was more hurt um, because I think when you're an adult uh, and you, you can drive you can make your own decisions you'll always find a way to do something the fact that I'm traveling an hour and a half to coach Loughborough Lightning was something that I could buy into but if I was a 17, 16-year-old kid and um, I wanted to aspire to play Super League, well, suddenly that journey looks very different, especially if I haven't got a um, a really committed mum or dad. Or they might be committed, but are they going to be home from working time to be able to drive me to Loughborough? So I more felt that, you know, it was unjust on the, the girls that were in the system and that that was what was key to bringing Super League back to Yorkshire was that we should be in a position to offer any girl the opportunity to play netball. And we're not there yet, um, uh, but we're, we're driving in the right way. I think what we're keen to do and we're working with a, a partner at the minute is just make netball more accessible um, to everybody and uh, give everyone the opportunity to play at the highest level that they can do. And I think, you know, step one was getting the Super League team back and having a clear pathway. Step two is making it as accessible as, as it can be to everybody. It, it, it is that that bit breaking down barriers, isn't it? And for, for you, that you you've kind of you pretty much have brought down a massive one that you've got something more localized, which is absolutely class. But you know that's probably something that weighed heavily on you. That it's sometimes you've got to kind of look at circumstances. The easiest thing would have been, well, if you want to do it, they'll travel. But there's so many different circumstances, and it's about finding those diamonds, isn't it? As well, like for us, some of those girls might come from a bit of a different background in rugby. So you know. Rugby League has got a very certain stereotype and similar sorts of people access it. And the girls that don't usually access it is sometimes ones that, you know, you want to tap into as well as those, those players, as well as those athletes, because they've got so much to offer. So it's actually rather than just doing what you've always done, thinking outside the box. And for you, it, it's such an exciting journey and one... I, I genuinely am really excited about it. The fact that, you know, you're going to be playing in 2021 in, in Leeds First Direct Arena, hopefully that's correct, isn't it? Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to have a couple of games there. That's definitely what we're working towards. That'll be amazing. So so special. I'll be I'll be certainly getting getting tickets tickets to come and to come and watch that. Um, and hopefully see some of those girls that have started on that development journey with you go through that that conveyor belt that you speak about. And I think that that's probably similar to me. That's where you'll get the most pride seeing those girls that sort of started and and then coming all the way through. Um, so just just moving on, you you've got so much experience, so much background and new bits are coming to light out there. I know that you went to a conference um I, I don't know I don't know why I didn't go it wasn't that I would be in rubbish and just didn't go I think I were committed coaching in schools at the foundation couldn't have the day off um but it were about ACL injuries and that's a real common injury in, in netball in general isn't it but also the change in um research that's become available and 
what you said earlier before we started recording about um, just looking at athletes as women and men as very, very different rather than a lot of research tends to be on men first and, and, and the difference that that's making on the game. Yeah, again, I think it's moving towards women's sport being more specific to females rather than just us pinching the bits of male research that we might be able to benefit from. <clears throat> you know, we're very different. <laughs> we're very different beings and uh, you know emotionally physically everything you know we're very different so it's good to see that there is some research being driven by the EIS um, I, f um, I forget the, the name of the project off the top of my head but uh, the woman that spoke uh, was absolutely fantastic and uh, she went into detail about um, you know the menstrual cycle and how that would affect um, you know an athlete and when they're more prone to have an ACL injury, when you should be loading your weights uh, based on your menstrual cycle in and when you should be deloading, when you might feel a little bit ropey, and what the consequences are of that. So there was a, there was a lot of um, detail and I think they they said there was still a lot more work to be done on that, but the level of detail they went into about what could affect a, a female participant's performance was huge from the fact that, you know, two of us could be in an 100 metre race and I could win it just on the fact that I'm at a certain point in my menstrual cycle in comparison to you. And what sits around that means just, just that alone means I could win that race, even before you start thinking about the training aspect of it. Um, you know, and they showed us a few clips of um, Olympic athletes just being really honest about, you know, their struggles with their menstrual cycle and what they'd done with the coach to be able to put themselves in a better position where they could deal with it better. Um, because, you know, it is a big part of women's lives, you know, and um, it's something that we have to manage. And young girls coming through, I do think that's um, something that we probably don't give them enough support with um, and um, listen to the problems. And I think some of that is we're just not in a comfortable space with that at the moment um, and also how that's perceived. And I think at some point we'll probably get to that comfortable space of being able to talk about it openly um and how it might affect things so so they um touched on when people are most um likely to get an acl injury um but also england netball themselves have started doing um different tests uh, for each athlete that um makes them more susceptible highlights if they're more susceptible to an acl injury and then from that they give them um some exercises to do um and everything else that may just keep it at bay so um yeah so there's a lot of interesting stuff going around uh about acls and and what the yeah well, we'll probably have to. We'll have to. I'll have to pick your brains again another time, and I'm certainly interested in what you might be doing on on your programs to mm. uh, to support it. Because I know, you, obviously, I, it's quite close to me with the fact that I I did mine, but it, it sort of all spiraled and went downhill. But aside from that, it's it's a lengthy injury for anyone to have, anyways. And the fact that you know women, the fact that the hips are wider, the more likely to have that injury and all that sort of stuff. But you know, community clubs are even asking us at the rugby league side, like, how can we help them? Because a lot of the, the stuff is prehab and, and training, not 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 training less, but just training smarter. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's that's really interesting, and it'll be good that there's there's two of us who have got women's sport and in in different uh, you know fields that we can we can share best practice. That's what I'm looking forward to. Um, it's been great talking, and there's one thing that's been bothering them all the way through. I wanted to ask you it's really random it is netball based it's really random the kid like i'm not gonna lie whenever i played netball and i played netball at school and i got told they were a bit too a bit too boisterous like i get you can't i would never say that netball's a non-contact sport because i know that's something you never say because it is a tough sport and i respect netballers i think that they do an amazing job you know the fit the strength the strong the they're everything that an, an athlete should be i always got told they're a bit too boisterous and I played again, so Kate Lightfoot worked at the foundation a fair few years ago and she got us to enter a charity a charity netball um, tournament and I loved it and I, I, saw, I, sold myself, I saw myself there as I'm, I'm not playing unless I'm centre. <laughs> do, do all kids want to be centre or do all people who play netball want to be centre or is it just me? 
I think it might just be you, Lois. Really? <laughs> you, know, you can go where you want and you can run around like a loon. That's it. I want playing if I want playing centre. I think most people want the glory positions, the goal shooter and goal attacks. I think yeah, uh, <laughs> it's only the, uh, I think the mad ones that want to play centre that are fit and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, like uh, the, the kind of have an influence but... on the game. So maybe you're, uh, you know, a big, uh, uh, what do you call it, playmaker in uh, rugby. Would you, would that, that say in your position, that's what you are, a playmaker? Because that's the centre yeah. of really. I like to be in control, but I'd say that it's more about the fact that there's less to think about, about which lines I can run to. <laughs> just run, yeah. <laughs> I can just run, I can do what I want. Honestly, that were, if anyone wants to play netball after after lockdown, I'd love to. I know you played um, a couple of weeks ago, you had a, not a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, you had a charity one, and I'd have loved to play it if my, if my knee wasn't um, dodgy, but... Um, it, it was brilliant and whoever says it's non content I remember I came into the office and I had the biggest um, court burn you know from falling over <laughs> this bloke, we were playing with this nice bloke give me give me elbow push me over give him back as good as he got as I got but I, I loved it I'll have to um, dig out some photos to, to prove it but it, it was really really good um, and, and I'm just genuinely really really grateful you took some time out today I'm sure it might have been the easiest part of your day if you've been homeschooling, but I mean, with it being easy, you might not. Um, uh, it's nice to speak to an adult, Lois, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, Anna, thank you so much. I'm really, really excited about the journey that you're you're taking and, you know, you've been a great inspiration to watch how you've kind of just been persistent. You've said it's not been straightforward, but um, the things that aren't the easiest are sometimes the best when they when they eventually come around. So I'm looking forward to supporting the Leeds Rhinos Women's Netball team in 2021. And I'm sure so many of the people across Yorkshire and certainly the Leeds Rhinos fan base will be too. So thank you so much for taking the time out. And I look forward to seeing you when we're back to work. Thanks, Lois. Cheers. Take care. <laughs>